Welcome to the 204th uh, regular um, monthly meeting of the New York Linux Users Group, the latest in our uh, regular monthlies. Um, tonight we're going to be hearing from Dan Westervelt from Canonical. He'll be talking to us uh, about what you see up on the screen here, Ubuntu 16.04 with what's new in Ubuntu 16.04, Xenial Xerus, which is an X, not a Z. And uh, I wanted to mention, Dan uh, and I were talking, it turns out he is, and I, uh, this is of great interest to me, mainly on the cloud and server side of things. So if that's what you're doing with Ubuntu or interested in, this is great, this is your opportunity. If you're more on the desktop side, Dan will try to field your questions. He will probably also be able to put you in touch with someone who knows a little more if your question goes deep at that end. So um, yeah, so there you go. Um, so. Uh, I'd like to say how much we appreciate Bloomberg for sponsoring us with this space, and thank you to everyone who's here for taking this opportunity to come and join us tonight. Uh, we are here for you, and we can only do this if you come out, and uh, we really appreciate your showing up. Um, tonight, before we get started, we have the usual requests. One is silence your cell phones. I haven't done that yet. If it beeps, I will be suitably chagrined, but please do it now for yourself. Um, do not eat snacks in noisy wrappers during the presentation. Uh, whatever you have to do, make sure you're not going to bother your neighbors. Uh, please uh, use these mics for questions. Dan has asked that if you have a question, just come on up. You'll get called on, um, and the questions will. Just, he'll take questions during the presentation, so feel free. Um, our next meeting will be, I believe, Wednesday, May 18th. Uh, it's not actually up on the Meetup page, so if I get that wrong, please double check once we are ready to announce it. We don't have the copy yet exactly, but we will. And it's going to be Luce we uh, Wager from Mozilla speaking about WebAssembly. Uh, if that is interesting to you or someone you know, please pass that on. That will be next month. Um, I'd again like to thank our regular space sponsor, Bloomberg, and also acknowledge our other sponsors, past and present, that is IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, Google, and O'Reilly Media for their support. Um, in addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our volunteers um, who have contributed greatly. You see them outside at the desk helping out. You see them at the uh, uh, workshops if you go there helping out. Um, so we, we, you know, if you if you see them and you appreciate them, please let them know. Um, so. Uh, announcements, I have a couple for this month. First off, for the workshops, please talk to uh, Rob or David Bristow. Uh, David's right here. Uh, is Rob here today? Yeah, of course he's here. Where's my head? Um, but please talk to them if you want to know more information about the workshops. They are um, happening at the City University, right? Um, and they are up on the Meetup page as well. Um, in case you missed it on the way in, there are Linux distro DVDs on the back table. There is a uh, 16, Ubuntu 16.04 uh, Beta 2 DVD available. There is apparently an issue with the installer if you're going to try to install it on something that already has a swap partition, so don't do that. There's a workaround too, but just don't do that or you know, wait another day. Um, yes, that's what we're all hoping. <laughs> um, Lastly, of the announcements that I'm going to be making here is uh, one of our past sponsors, IBM. It has an event they're putting on called Brewed by Open Power. Um, you can RSVP for the event, which will take place on Wednesday, May 4th from 6 to 9 p.m. at Tavern 29 here in the city. They're going to be giving away beer and food and having a networking opportunity for other Linux developers from Ubuntu, IBM, and more is what they say. So search for that on... Um, uh, search for that on Eventbrite, and this is, uh, has to do with their um, open power uh, announcements that are coming about. They're looking for people to do interesting stuff, and if that's something that you are interested in, then you may want to, um, you may want to sign up there. Um, and after the presentation, we'll be heading to Jake's Saloon this time at 206 West 23rd Street. That's going to be just west of 7th Avenue. We'll go out in groups and get you there uh, if you will come along. Uh, does anyone in the audience, do any, does anyone have other announcements that they would like to make? This is your opportunity. Um, future events or anything like that? No? All right. Well, at the end of the presentation, we have four books to give away. Dan will be asking questions. This is our regular trivia. Um, so uh, pay attention, and uh, please welcome Dan Westervelt with What's New in Ubuntu 1604, Xenial Zerus. Zerus. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, obviously, I'm not Mark Baker, and the signage outside uh, was claiming that Mark Baker was going to be here and talking about uh, Ubuntu. Uh, Mark is the product manager for OpenStack and, to some degree, our server release um, I oversee all of engineering for the cloud division. Cloud division covers um, Ubuntu Server, um, OpenStack, um, all of our public cloud offering, and all the tooling around that. 
Um, I actually oversee IS, uh, IS for, uh, for Canonical as well, which is all of our internal information systems. Um, so if you have questions or you know, want to talk about the desktop, I can do my best. Um, I'm probably not the best person for that. Um, like I said, I'm more than happy to try. Um, so yeah, 1604, um, a lot of uh, great things uh, are coming out. I'm going to be going over. Um, sort of the flow of this um, is that I'd much rather have you ask questions as they come. Um, you don't have to wait to the end. Just you know, like Peter was saying, come up and ask them. I'd rather it must be much more dynamic. Uh, tomorrow is our release, um, 1604. Actually, someone had asked, you know, what, what does that mean? And that's the actual date. It's you know, April of 2016. Um, and we'll go over our release cycle and how that sort of maps out. Um, tomorrow night uh, is actually the release. Uh, so if I seem a little bit hyper, um, it's been a long couple days for us, uh, and I didn't expect to come in and give this talk, but more than happy to do it. Um, so to start off, um, don't know, well, before I actually get into that, how many people use Ubuntu here? OK, how many people use it on the server? In cloud, public cloud, or OpenStack? OK, cool. How many people here use a lot of other distributions as well, like RHEL or CentOS? Or... OK, great. So a decent amount of uh, Ubuntu. So to get into it, um, what people may not realize is that Canonical uh, is the actual corporate entity behind uh, Ubuntu. The founder, as many of you may know, is Mark Shuttleworth um, in 2004. Um, it was primarily focused on desktop, um, which we gained a lot of developer traction in the early days as sort of being the distro known to, to always just work. Um, God, in 2004, I think I was, I was still on Wall Street uh, using Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux RHEL. Um, from then, a little bit more personal background for myself, uh, in about 2008, after the financial meltdown, I decided to leave. Uh, that environment for a bit uh, and took an opportunity with SUSE. I was with SUSE for about four years uh, in their Linux Solutions Group, which was a team uh, that was uh, basically dedicated to um, high value customers, uh, mostly on Wall Street. Um, so I have a lot of background uh, in that area. Um, so going back to, to Canonical, um, we, we fund a lot of people uh, doing development of not only Ubuntu, but a lot of the tooling around Ubuntu. Um, both on the desktop uh, and on the server side. Ubuntu, as you know, uh, also has a very large um, community of contributors that aren't actually canonical uh, employees. Uh, and we you know, welcome uh, them to, uh, to the family and uh, very much value their contributions. So with that, from the um, enterprise traction um, side of it, most people may not realize that um, we have a huge traction in um, what you would consider like scale out computing. So the big difference between us and Red Hat and to some degree SUSE is that when we got into the server market about five, six years ago, we knew that we couldn't compete with them. Um, so they were very much embedded um, in what you'd consider the vertically, um, you know, the vertical uh, enterprise uh, market. Um, and what we basically decided was, well, we can't compete with them, so what are we gonna do? At that time, virtualization was huge. Um, cloud was still pretty new. Uh, we decided that that was the market that we'd have to get into uh, to actually be able to uh, thrive in, in sort of the server uh, division. So uh, a lot of these uh, customers uh, today um, basically are fall within that model. For instance, Netflix, um, for those of you who are big in sort of the, the DevOps model of uh, development and operations, uh, all of Netflix now runs on top of Ubuntu server uh, on EC2, um, although I think they may be moving off of EC2 to some degree. Uh, some really uh, you know, big other ones, um, for instance, Best Buy um, has a, a cloud, uh, OpenStack cloud. Um, Bloomberg is a huge consumer of our OpenStack cloud. Um, you know, Instagram, um, Wikipedia, all these basically run on top of Ubuntu to a very large degree. Um, so I think that's uh, usually very surprising to people um, you know, that, that we have such traction in, in those areas. So Microsoft is a very interesting one. Um, Microsoft has a public cloud, Azure. Uh, I don't know how many people uh, know that. Um, we consider it one of the top three or four uh, public clouds out there, being EC2, uh, Google Compute Engine, and uh, Azure. Um, Linux on Azure is actually huge. Um, I think they were saying like one out of every four instances is an Ubuntu instance. Um, there's a much smaller um, footprint there of, of Red Hat and SUSE, and then a very large footprint of Windows. 
So we partner with Microsoft um, in many ways. It's a very strong partnership. One is on the Azure cloud. Um, we have a Hadoop offering, um, or actually Microsoft has a Hadoop offering uh, on that cloud that's based on Ubuntu. Um, and many of you may have seen the even more interesting announcement that just came out a couple, uh, actually like a week or two ago, um, where uh, I think the marketing headline was uh, Bash on Windows. But the reality is that it's not just Bash. And God, I could think back 10 plus years where people were using Sigwin to run <laughs> Bash and other things on there. So from our perspective, we were a little bit, oh, well, that doesn't really sound cool. But the reality is, is much, much uh, deeper than that. The reality is that you're actually running um, native Linux, in this case Ubuntu, um, binaries on Windows. Uh, Windows has uh, essentially a kernel module that's doing live uh, translation of all their system calls. Um, so for them, uh, the, the first big win is to basically be able to claim that you can run Bash and bring the Bash experience uh, to Windows. Um, but the reality is you could download a compiler and compile it almost anything you want uh, within you know, boundaries right now, but some of those are going to be broken down. And just run an application native, uh, an Ubuntu Linux application native on Windows. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, um, I think uh, Dustin Kirkland, uh, who is one of our product managers for the server side, has written a uh, really nice blog uh, on how to actually test that out today. Um, so I, I just invite you to go Google that and uh, give it a try. It's uh, pretty cool stuff. So uh, another thing that we're known for is predictable velocity, um, another reason why it might seem a little bit on edge right now. Um, like I said, it's been a pretty stressful week for us. Um, we have a six-month release cadence, um, which is very unique uh, when it comes to the enterprise Linux market. And also, to step back a minute, um, the other big differentiator between Ubuntu and, say, like a Red Hat or a SUSE or any other distributions uh, that play in the enterprise market is that they usually split between what they consider their community release, uh, so Fedora versus RHEL or OpenSUSE versus SLES, um, and you know, the, the, you know, the enterprise release. So for us, the difference is that there's one release. It's Ubuntu. It's free to download. The updates are always free. Um, from the beginning, Mark Shuttleworth has made this commitment that those updates will always be there for you. We're never going to you know, hold any back. Um, <clears throat> The only difference is that if you want to pay us for support, uh, the Ubuntu Advantage is our support offering, and we're more than happy to uh, you know, obviously offer that to you. Um, so that's a huge differentiator for us. The other one is our very aggressive release cycle. So like I said, we release every six months, uh, and every two years we cut an LTS release. So 16.04 is our uh, you know, LTS release that we're releasing tomorrow. It's supported for five years. And then after that, every six months, we're going to release uh, an interim release, um, and it's every April and it's every October, which then goes back to the date. Uh, so 16.04 uh, for tomorrow, and then in October it's going to be 16.10, and so on and so on. So those interim releases we support for nine months um, officially. Um, again, after that, uh, the updates start to dwindle off, and you're more than free to use it as long as you want. Um, we do have upgrade paths from every single one of our uh, releases. So if you start an LTS, you can upgrade all the way up through the next LTS. We're very aggressive um, with our kernel as well. Um, as you can see, uh, we're releasing 16.04 with a 4.4 kernel, which if you look at some of the, uh, our competitors in the enterprise space, is, is a much, much modern kernel, much more modern kernel than, than they have. Um, the other thing that's very unique is on an LTS, um, we actually have um, support for hardware enablement kernels. So every time we have an interim release, the kernel that's released on the interim, interim release, so 16.10's kernel will be supported on 16.04. And then 17.04 uh, will be supported on uh, the LTS release 16.04, all the way up until we get to the next uh, LTS release. Um, so I think that's very unique as well. Um, we also have a three-week uh, release cadence on kernel updates. Um, and that is um, a very regular release that we do. Um, so if there are, you know, Bug fixes, uh, whatever, you can depend that every three weeks we're going to have an update. If it's a critical you know, uh, security release, obviously we're going to cut a you know, next day or same day patch, um, which is you know, pretty obvious. So, cool. Any questions on the release cycle? No, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, the kernel stuff. So, um, let's say I'm running on the 1404 kernel. You said that you backported the kernel 1404. Do I have to use the kernel 404? So if you're an Ubuntu Advantage customer and you hit a bug that's been fixed, we're obviously going to say update um, to the latest kernel. Um, but as far as you know, forcing you into again, you know, back in my SUSE days, we basically forced I think within a six-month time frame, 
everyone to update to service pack, the next service pack, service pack one or two or whatever it is. Um, we don't do that. Um, you know, we basically allow you to run it as long as you want. Uh, but then again, if, if you're you know, an Ubuntu Advantage support customer uh, and there's bugs, we'll obviously ask you to update, um, but it's not a forced update. Well, any other questions? Okay. And this, uh, by the way, um, holds not only for server, uh, but for desktop as well. They all basically come off of the Ubuntu core release. Um, and the only difference between the two, well, the main difference between the, uh, the desktop is um, all of the, obviously, GUI components. Uh, which roll up into a meta package. So if you have Ubuntu Server to, uh, installed, it's <coughs> as simple as a sudo apt install um, Unity desktop, and you know you basically have a, uh, a desktop experience. So another thing is uh, unmatched choice. Um, one of the things that people love about uh, Debian and uh, Ubuntu, uh, more Debian-based distro, um, is that there's a massive uh, amount of applications that are out there um, that are basically prepackaged. Um, one of the things I'm going to be talking about is that we also support um, essentially almost every architecture uh, that you could think of, including uh, cell phones, uh, which right there is an Ubuntu phone. Um, we just recently uh, basically released uh, a beta program for uh, Linux One, which is the IBM mainframe offering that they're coming out with. So Ubuntu is now available on an IBM mainframe. Uh, the interesting thing about that and how that relates to this is that um, we basically had to compile our distro for it. And by compiling our distro, we also compiled our universe, which is our archive of software um, that, to some degree, is either supported or not supported. So anything that falls in main, by default, we support. Anything that falls uh, in universe, you can run, but we don't necessarily support it under the UA uh, Ubuntu Advantage support program. So uh, what actually amazed me, um, and I've been doing this at Canonic for three years, uh, and uh, like I said, oversee a large uh, amount of the development that goes on there, is that in uh, total, we have, tw oh, I think it was, when I checked last week, over 20,000 packages available for the IBM mainframe uh, for Ubuntu. Um, so that just means for x86 and ARM, we have at least that many, probably more. Uh, there is a subset of packages that just don't make sense to compile uh, for the mainframe. So it's a massive ecosystem uh, of applications that are out there. Um, and that's just sort of a, a little bit of a, a graphic to try and represent that. So 16.04, uh, uh, some of the big things that we're very excited about. Uh, it's a huge release for us. Um, OpenZFS, uh, we are the first distribution to actually ship the ZFS file system. Uh, not only do we ship it, but we will support it. And it is not shipped as a DKMS module. It's actually shipped uh, as a binary module. Uh, so out of the box, you can run a ZFS file system, and we will support it. Uh, the other thing is LexD, which is our container story. Uh, I'm going to get into uh, a little bit more depth in all of these. Um, so if those are familiar with uh, containers. Obviously, Snappy is, is huge these days. Um, we support both LexD and Snappy. Um, and I'll go through what the differences uh, are for that. I'm sorry, LexD and, and Docker. Snappy uh, is another very interesting thing. Um, it's basically born and bred from the cell phone. Um, it's basically a transactional way of deploying Ubuntu um, and Ubuntu applications. Um, so we'll get into what that exactly means, but it's very exciting for us. Docker, obviously, is um, the uh, <coughs> containers for applications. Uh, OpenStack, um, we are, uh, I think, if, I don't know how many people here um, actually use OpenStack or are interested in OpenStack. Um, but if you look at the OpenStack uh, end user survey, which comes out every six months uh, leading up to their summit, the summit is actually next week uh, in Austin, um, they basically do a survey and ask how many people are using you know, different tools or how many people are using OpenStack on different distributions or releases, uh, a whole bunch of data you know, that they collect. The interesting thing is that um, Ubuntu uh, OpenStack is always the, the, you know, a very large uh, majority of the actual deployed OpenStack uh, you know, instances today. So for instance, I think uh, the production deployments, we were like 55% of those uh, who responded. Um, and it goes on with uh, integration and, and development as well. Uh, our tooling um, is starting to, to climb the ladder very quickly. I think we're at like 9% uh, for Juju, which is our tooling that we use um, you know, professionally to deploy OpenStack. Um, so we are um, you know, huge with OpenStack. And so a little bit of the history there um, is that when OpenStack started, um, you know, we, we were just sort of getting into this market, like I said, and we wanted to basically focus on the scale-out market. Um, so we basically knew we were going to be playing in cloud. And a lot of this predates me, but the story goes that 
our original releases, there was an Ubuntu cloud, which was based on Eucalyptus, um, which was another cloud that people were uh, trying to basically bootstrap. And I believe the big thing with Eucalyptus was that they were trying to be uh, somewhat API compatible with EC2. Um, so that didn't work out so well um, for Eucalyptus. Um, so we basically started looking for other options. And OpenStack was you know, basically being released into the wild um, from the NSA, or I'm sorry, NASA at that point. Um, so we met up with them at what was essentially their first summit um, and uh, struck up a really good relationship. And uh, it worked out so well that they basically follow our release cycle every six months, um, which is great. Um, they use a lot of our tooling uh, as far as uh, you know, their, their release uh, and all. Um, it's a little bit stressful for us internally because that means every six months, uh, not only are we releasing a distribution of our own, but we're also releasing an OpenStack distribution. So it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, and the last one uh, was the IBM Linux One, which is us on the mainframe. So open ZFS. Um, anyone here use ZFS? OK, great. On Linux? Flyers? OK, cool. Um, on Linux or Flyers? Linux, OK. Which distribution? Okay, OK, cool. Yeah. Um, so on the enterprise side, the message that we've heard for a very long time is um, there are a couple of things from the Solaris uh, heyday, uh, on the height of Solaris, uh, that people really wanted to come over to Linux. Uh, one of those was Dtrace, and Oracle, who now owns Solaris, has brought that over to uh, OES Linux. Um, the other one uh, is obviously ZFS. Um, and to date, um, people could run OpenZFS on Linux, but no distribution was willing to support it. Uh, so with 16.04, like I said, we are actually going to be supporting it. It's going to be a binary module. It's going to be distributed. Um, and we're super excited about this. And a lot of uh, our customers uh, are super excited about it as well. So um, anyone here use ButterFS? OK, great. So you're at least familiar with some of the concepts. Um, so Zia, uh, And ButterFS was basically an attempt to uh, bring to uh, Linux um, some of the functionality that people on ZFS. So I'm not a ZFS expert. Um, these are some of the high-level things that it, it provides uh, that people really love about it. The copy and write is huge, uh, snapshotting backups, uh, the built-in integrity checking, um, and so on and so on. Um, so we're super excited about it. Um, the other thing is that it is actually a storage backend to our containers. Uh, so the, the LXC and uh, LXD containers that we have, you can actually create um, a ZFS a storage backend. Uh, so when you create um, essentially subsequent snapshots of your containers, it's super fast. I mean, it's, it's amazingly fast. And I'll try and show that off a little bit later. Cool. So LexD, does everyone know what LexD is? Some people, do people know what you know, LexC is, which has been around for a while? OK, so LexD is, oh, let me see. Again, this isn't my deck, so I apologize. So LexD provides machine containers. Um, machine containers is sort of a, a term that, that we uh, I don't know, started using to try and describe exactly the difference between LexD and something like uh, Docker. So for those of you who may not know, Docker um, is what we consider an application container. It basically has a single application in it. Uh, it's a distribution model uh, for developers to you know, very quickly iterate and then uh, release their applications. Um, but it's pretty much a, a single application uh, container. Um, and for the most part, it doesn't feel like an actual Linux machine. Uh, so what we decided to do was actually to take uh, Lexi, which was uh, a container technology that was originally developed at IBM um, that sort of moved over uh, from an upstream project to Canonical a couple years back. So the, both maintainers of the project are now Canonical employees, uh, Serge Hallen and Stefan Graber. <clears throat> So um, basically, what we decided was that hey, I think there, there's a you know a large uh, you know amount of people out there that still want to basically have a container um, that feels like an actual Linux machine or in this case an Ubuntu machine. Um, so that's what we did with uh, LexD, uh, which basically that's telling you. So. Um, Virtual machines, KVM, um, you know, VMware and such, uh, Linux containers, Linux physical machines. Um, the union of that is basically what we have for machine containers. Um, it brings the best of all those worlds. So it brings the speed of containers. Um, it brings the feel of a virtual machine. Um, and it brings uh, the performance of a physical machine. 
But here's a little bit of a chart uh, that goes through some of the differences between uh, the containers that are out there in the market. So there's the application containers, Docker, uh, probably being the most well-known uh, rocket, which uh, comes out of uh, core OS, uh, and run C, which uh, is part of the Docker, I think the larger Docker project. Um, and the machine containers uh, with LexD and OpenVZ, OpenVZ being a parallels um, you know, project. Uh, it basically just goes through all the things that I just said. Um, you know, I don't know if anyone has any questions on this. I'm more than happy to answer them. This gives a little bit of a uh, graphical representation of what a LexD container uh, is. Uh, we jokingly started calling it the lighter visor and it got legs. So if you actually uh, look at some of our uh, official corporate messaging or blogs from a lot of our developers, it'll be referenced as the lighter visor. Uh, and that's going to take that. Um, it brings a hypervisor experience uh, to the container world. Um, and that's basically what the goal was. And I think we're pretty much there. Um, so you have a whole bunch of hosts uh, that are just standard Ubuntu hosts. Uh, they're running the LexD daemon, uh, which has a rich uh, REST API. Um, and from that API, you know, you can basically use our Lexi command line. Um, you can, you know, talk to the API directly. Um, and also very interesting, which I'll get into a little more detail, is that we have NC LexD, which uh, is native support for LexD within OpenStack. <clears throat> so in the past, there was attempts to make uh, containers available, Lexi containers available within OpenStack uh, via libvirt. Uh, libvirt uh, is... It's not the, the most user-friendly um, or maybe stable thing uh, if, if you want to go there. Um, so basically what we decided to do was to bring the LexD support uh, natively to OpenStack. Um, the other neat thing um, is that um, while we are the developers and maintainers of LexD, we're also not only uh, huge consumers of Docker, uh, but we're also um, supporting Docker today. So if you actually look at some of the Docker repos, I think at one point when I checked like four months ago, it was like 60 or 70% of all Docker um, images out there are basically Ubuntu based. Uh, so more people use Docker on Ubuntu images than anyone else. Um, and we support Docker on Ubuntu today. Uh, we have it as part of our release and we'll actually uh, support it um, with relationships and partnerships we have with docker.io. Um, so we're not just, you know, a single container strategy uh, here. If you want, uh, you know, the, the ease of use uh, of an application container with Docker, we got you covered. If you want the flexibility uh, and the feel of an actual system container, uh, we can do that with XD. What we're trying to represent here is the other kind of really neat thing is that if you want to run Docker containers um, nested within LexD, you can do that as well. So you can actually start up a, a LexD container and then start deploying Docker containers within that. And again, you know, from the end user, it looks and feels very much just like you're running Docker containers on a physical system. Um, you can try LexD for yourself. Um, actually, does anyone have any questions before I try and get into this? Okay, cool. LexD on 14.04? Or 1410, or whatever? Yeah, I don't think you can do that today, but we are bringing it back to 1404. Yeah, to trusty. Cool. Any other questions? All right. So here's uh, some of the actual containers that I have running today on a 1604. Um, as you see, the first one is CentOS. Uh, so not only can you run Ubuntu uh, containers, LexD containers on Ubuntu, you can run basically any Linux version you want, and we have support and images out there for most all of them. Um, I think with the addition, the, 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 except for um, RHEL and SLES, because those are end user licensed encumbered, that doesn't mean that you can't run them under LexD, it just means you have to create your own images. So if I do a LexC uh, list, uh, I believe it is. Pull up my cheat sheet here. Let's see image list is which is a remote. Oh. Helps if I'm on the Wi Fi. Yeah, is it the Civic Hall or? Special for you. I can log you 
Oh, presenter. Yeah. I see you using unit. Yeah. Also use gnome, gnome classic, or Yeah, absolutely. Just like you always were able to use uh, in the past. It's not our default. Um, it's not the one that we technically support under Ubuntu Advantage, but you're absolutely more than uh, welcome to use them. And I believe that the meta packages for those are fairly simple. It's just like GNOME-desktop, so you can do sudo apt install GNOME-desktop. Uh, the KD one I don't know offhand. So image list. So. Um, these are some of the images that are out there uh, and available. So at, these are all at linuxcontainers.org. Um, images uh, is the re, what we call a remote, which is basically a remote uh, repo of images. Um, so I mean, here we go in, in Ubuntu. Uh, a lot of those out there. Um, so these are the ones that I actually have local. Um, so just to give you an example, uh, and these are the ones that are currently running. So I sent us one running, uh, one that's actually a, uh, an Ubuntu one uh, that's alias Juju, um, which is a tooling that I can get into in a little bit, uh, and then two uh, Ubuntu ones. So if I wanted a, a new uh, cont LXD container instance of it, I can just do launch. Uh, There, done. I have a new boot to three. So then what I can do is um, I can do LXC um, exec boot to three bash. There. That's a new container. So if you want to there. Looks and feels just like anything else. Oop. There, less than five seconds. Um, I could write a for loop and spin up like 100 of these. Um, we've done scale tests uh, with minimal uh, instances, and I mean, it's, it's pretty insane. Uh, can't really do much with them. I could probably start up like 500 on this laptop, um, but yeah. Cool. Any questions on that? How does AppArm relay swap to the? Um... How does AppArm replace with each instance of? This yeah. Form? So that by, there's a default AppArm profile um, that, when you instantiate one of these, um, is basically used. You can have your own profiles. You can tell it to use your own profiles. Um, there's a Alexa. Uh, here. Um, don't know if it tells you here. No, it's not. Um, no, it doesn't say which one. But yeah, but by default, there is a uh, App Armor profile that's used. And again, you can have multiple App Armor profiles and basically use whatever one you want um, dynamically for whatever. Any other questions? Uh, this may sound like repeat, but it's sort of not. So supposing you were on 1410 and you wanted to try this. Yep. Okay, what would you suggest? So you said that LexD was not possible on 1410, but you know, there are other, there's, you know, other. I think there's a PPA out there, to be honest, that you can just install it. What? There's a PPA, uh, a software repo out there that you can just install it. I would just Google it. Um, I don't know off the top of my head uh, what versions back we support today. Um, there's a good chance even 1404. It is on our, our roadmap to support 1404 with LexD 2.0. Um, I just don't know if we have that out fully supported today. Um, given that this uh, that that 
Lexd and started getting used to the pronunciation rather than LXC or LXD. Yeah. So we, we did change that from yeah. Lexd to Lex, from LXC to LexC and LexD. Okay. Uh, I'm just curious whether you have a way to do uh, desktop, uh, like I don't know, browsers or whatever you wanted to have separate sessions for yourself or environments for yourself, just ways to interact with uh, with the windowed environment you have there, rather than uh, just as independent systems that would run as servers. Oh, to have like a desktop um, under Lexi. Um, I think there may be issues with that today. I don't know. I can find out. Um, again, I'm on the server side. I've never actually tried it. It's uh, pretty interesting. Um, yeah. It'll be more useful than the workspaces. Oh. When you're developing stuff which plays with the system and configurations and such. So there is, there is actually is a real uh, use case there. Yeah, no, we have actually um, some data out there how on your desktop, for instance, on the Unity uh, taskbar, you can actually have each one of those launch in its own Lexi container. So if you wanted to do uh, essentially like containerization of all the applications that you launch within a desktop, absolutely that can be done. Um, whether or not you can actually connect to that, um, I, I guess you probably could. You could start up, uh, well, I don't know. I have to find out. I, I don't know if you could actually have like uh, a VNC or something running in, in one of those containers and connect to it and actually display out a separate desktop. Uh, I guess in theory that's totally possible. Yeah, there you go. Just like if, uh, like in Docker, you can do a volume mapping between hosts and and the containers. Like, is there a possibility in that? Or yeah, so uh, absolutely. There's storage backends uh, currently. Like I said, I'm using a ZFS storage backend. Um, Peter had asked about per persistence. Um, I don't actually have a good answer for that today. Um, so if you had like an external drive, like in KVM or something, where you can actually map to a, a, an additional drive, um, I don't know. Um, we do have the ability uh, to migrate these, so you can either you know, basically shut one down and migrate it to another host running LexD. Um, so the persistence of whatever data you have in uh, the root image obviously gets transferred over, and I believe that you can point to uh, other data volumes and have that happen as well. The other really neat thing that we have is uh, CreU, which is a, uh, a project uh, checkpoint uh, in user space. So you can actually checkpoint these live uh, and do live migrations. So if you had an application running, um, you could basically do a, a checkpoint of it uh, with a single command line and migrate it off to another system. Uh, we have really cool demos out there that we've been doing for a while. Um, and actually, the Docker guys kind of copied us a little bit on this. But um, we were running uh, Doom, uh, and we basically uh, had two systems um, with a, a third one where we had a laptop that was connected to one, and we were you know, just had the display back out to it, and we were playing Doom on it, um, and we basically did a mi live migration playing it, and you lost about like five frames, and it just basically went from one of the servers to the other server. Um, so it's pretty cool. Uh, we are going to be supporting that in OpenStack under the NC LexD, uh, not with the initial release, but we're going to have an update a little bit later on where you'll actually be able to do live migration of OpenStack uh, containers uh, from one you know, server to another, essentially. I'd like start up like multiple uh, LXD containers, uh, would there be any like a sort of a YAML based language or something that you, you can like specify because like you're not going to type every single time like I'm going to start a container. <coughs> so if you want to persist something. Yeah, like so we, we have um, with three or four containers. Yes, yeah, so we have uh, a config file uh, to actually set the default configuration for the containers. But we have an API. Uh, so if you wanted to do this at scale and integrate it with something else, I would say just basically talk directly to the API. Um, and if you wanted to have uh, an experience um, where you had, say, maybe even a more, more rich uh, API with like the networking storage bits built in, I would say you know, that's essentially what we do with OpenStack. So. I mean, OpenStack's a little bit heavy if you want to do very lightweight things, um, but if you wanted a sort of I, you know, IAS type environment uh, with the LexD backends, that, that's the way to go today. Cool. So I assume each one of these machines is running a separate kernel? Like no, it's all the same kernel. It's all the same kernel? Yep. OK. They're all name spaced out, um, you know, basically uh, C groups, 100% supported. Not only is C groups supported, but you don't have to understand C groups to do it. Um, I think it's actually in the presentation. Um, 
So is this actually using LexD in the back end then? LexD is, there you go. So you can limit like CPU, memory, um, throughput, things like that. Uh, so it's using LexD as the actual daemon in the back end um, that acts as the, the hypervisor or the lighter visor, um, which basically does all the creation of the LexD contain Lex containers for you. But they all share the same kernel, um, which is why they're so lightweight and why it's so quick to actually, they're not actually booting. Um, you know, they're, they're just instantiating uh, the, the image essentially. Um, How's it using virtualization then? So today it's not actually using like any hardware uh, virtualization like optimizations. Um, we are working with Intel and others to actually get some of that support in. Um, but a container will perform um, basically the same as uh, bare metal. And we've had to prove this. We had some HPC um, customers and we were working with Intel um, where we had to basically prove within a very small margin of error that uh, a LexD container, a LexD container would perform the same as the bare metal. Uh, and I mean, you could try this yourself. You just, you know, get a laptop, uh, you know, do a, a sys benchmark, uh, start up a container, run the same benchmark, and you'll see it's essentially the same. Um, where that differs is if you have a ton of containers uh, doing a bunch of work, obviously any single one of those isn't going to perform as if it was the same as a bare metal system. Yeah, not I, doing I anything. just misinterpreted from the LexD slide. I thought basically you were saying that you were leveraging KVM and virtualization as part of that. This one? Uh, not the one with the Venn diagram, yeah. Oh, no, that was more from the experience or the feel of it. Um, okay. The best of all, you know, all worlds, but yeah. Okay, um, so it's just basically using namespaces just like Docker, then, right? Yep. Okay. Cool. Other questions? Cool. Uh, I definitely, you know, welcome anyone to go out there and give it a try. It's it's really cool. Um, you know, even as you were saying, like if you have a desktop and you want to basically have a higher level of protection um, and domaining of all of your applications, that's absolutely possible. And we have uh, blog posts out there that goes through some of that. So Snappy. Um, Snappy is another very interesting one. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this is an Ubuntu phone. Hopefully the battery is still good. Yep. The Nexus 4, so it's pretty old. But it's running Ubuntu on a phone. Um, pretty much the same core Ubuntu that we're running uh, on my you know, desktop or in the cloud or on anything else. <clears throat> so what Snappy is, um, essentially was our first um, transition into saying, that um, we wanted to get into the IoT market. So IoT is a huge buzzword right now, that inter Internet of Things. Uh, and any given place you go, I'm sure in this room alone, there's probably five or 10 uh, little micro devices running Linux on it, uh, including the projector. Uh, so what we realized is that um, there's a proliferation of these all over the world right now. A huge amount of them uh, are running uh, Linux. Uh, and a very large subset of those are running either a Debian or Ubuntu uh, Linux. Um, and it's all very, very unsecure. Uh, so the dirty little secret that most of you probably know, but that the average you know, end user doesn't know is that it has all the same bugs and heart bleed and everything else that it had from the day that it was released, because no one ever updates the firmware because it's like, you know, hit that update button, cross your fingers and pray. Um, and the average person doesn't even know that they have to do that. Um, and the release cycle for a lot of those is um, almost non-existent, to be honest with you, in your home. Not to mention the devices that have uh Access. Oh yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, so um, what we decided was that this was a, a huge issue, um, and since the majority of the market share is running on, you know, a Debian variant, uh, or in many cases Ubuntu, um, that we should address that. So what we realized was that all the work that we put into the phone to do application isolation uh, a little bit differently than what I was talking about with uh, LexD, um, and all that um, was very applicable to that market as well. Uh, so we took that work and put it into a project that's called Snappy. And uh, the big difference is classic Ubuntu, um, basically any package can technically write to any file. Um, and there's a lot of uh, security concerns there uh, and a lot of uh, potential for collisions. Snappy Ubuntu uh, was an attempt to basically rethink the, the model, again, based on what we had done with the phone, to say how can we segregate this out um, to make sure that your application uh, is by default um, you know, isolated, essentially. Uh, so the three big things with Snappy um, is it has transactional updates, which means that if you deploy a Snappy image, 
um, and you want to go to the next release, it's actually a transactional uh, binary uh, operation. Um, it's not updating a bunch of packages or anything. It's updating one server image blob, or I'm um, sorry, snappy image blob. Um, and if that image blob fails and the kernel won't boot, it'll actually automatically fall back to the other one. So if you have hundreds of thousands of micro devices out there um, and you do a subset of canaries, say like 100 updates, and for every reason they fail, you don't have to worry about, oh, do I have to figure out how to log into this damn thing? Does it even have a terminal, whatever? It'll actually, by default, just roll back to the other release. So at a minimum, you're still up and running. Um, the other thing uh, is application confinement. So snaps are the actual uh, application um, packaging format. Um, very much like an RPM or a DEB, um, only it is much more along the sort of OSX model in that that application has every single thing it needs to run contained within that package itself, that snap itself. Um, it's not very much the experience uh, is like your phone again, uh, where you go to a snap store just like you go to the you know, I, you know, Apple store or you go to the, uh, the Google Play store, uh, and you'll basically install uh, your snap from there. Um, same thing as well, um, it's a basically binary operation. It either installs or it doesn't install, it either updates or it doesn't update. It's not half updated or you know, whatever. Um, it it's either is or it isn't. Um, and it has a very rich uh, application development um, tooling. Uh, so Snapcraft, uh, which I'm not gonna get into, but if you're interested in this, I would just go Google it. Um, if you wanna create your own snaps, uh, that's the tooling that we have today to actually do that. Um, it's matured massively over the past six months, um, and it's pretty easy to create your own snaps. Um, again, it's also based on a, a store um, type of model, so you basically can create a, a snap store, connect to the main snap store, uh, and pull your snaps from there. Um, this is a little bit of a uh, architectural layout, um, so obviously the snaps are on top. Skills are actually interfaces uh, between snaps uh, and the physical hardware. Um, and those skills have to be explicitly uh, defined um, because those are the things that actually give your application access to say like a, a camera on your laptop or a microphone or something like that. Um, and then uh, Ubuntu Core is the actual core release and then you have a kernel snap and a gadget snap. I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm not exactly sure what the difference between a kernel snap and a gadget snap is. Uh, that's all developed out of uh, my peer team, uh, not the cloud division team. So the thing that's really powerful about this is that um, we can have an ecosystem of kernels for different you know, devices, whether it's a Raspberry Pi or a Beagle Bone or a, you know, a, a, a cell phone or you know, some other SOC or something like that, um, where basically all you do is you know, pull that kernel in and you're good to go for that device. Um, we support Raspberry Pi today, so the, the easiest platform, if you wanted to kind of fool around with this um, on an actual, like, micro device uh, would be the Raspberry Pi, I think. Um, when it comes to the server, the really interesting thing is that you can actually run uh, Snappy in classic mode, uh, which is actually running Snappy on the server. So you can apt, uh, apt install uh, SnapD, which will bring in all the, the Snappy uh, packages, uh, and then you can Snap install any of the Snap packages that we have out there today uh, in the Snap store. Uh, so you don't actually need a, a little device like a Raspberry Pi or something to play around with it and get a feel for it. You can actually do that on the server release today. Um, like I said, we have transactional updates. Oh, and we also have the, the, the rollback, um, which I said was automatic. Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily have to be automatic. Um, you can actually roll back transactionally to any point at any time. Um, so if you, know, you realize that something wasn't working the way you expected, uh, you can roll back one release, two release, three release, and so on and so on. Um, so it's true transactional uh, you know, operating system um, as far as the deployment model. Well, like I said, the snaps are confined and isolated by default. Um, so in theory, no application can actually interfere with any other application. Um, it would be, uh, be very interesting um, if that was ever to happen. And really what that would mean is that someone had developed a skill, which are those interfaces that um, was not well defined and allowed uh, something like that to happen. Um, next thing is Docker. So, any questions about Snappy? Okay, cool. Uh, Docker. Uh, how many people here use Docker? Okay, great. On Ubuntu, how many people? 
Um, so like I said, uh, we support Docker today. We have Docker uh, packages, Debian packages, uh, Deb packages, not snaps um, for it. Uh, you can install it, and we support it today. Um, interesting enough, we also have uh, snaps for it, so you could actually snap install uh, Docker as well. Next thing is uh, OpenStack. Uh, how many people use OpenStack? Okay, in production or just like in a lab environment? Production, okay, cool. Ubuntu OpenStack? Oh, Debian, okay, interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, so like I said, uh, OpenStack is huge for us. Um, especially OpenStack within telcos. We have a huge number of uh, telcos now that are running uh, Ubuntu OpenStack. Um, Nova LexD, which I talked about a little bit, um, is what we're really, really excited about with this release. Um, and again, that's the ability to basically, instead of using KVM with an OpenStack, you can have a, a container environment. Uh, it's fully supported. Uh, the package is NC LexD. Um, you can download it and install it today. Um, and uh, yeah, it basically allows you um, to use containers instead of KVM virtual machines. So you get higher density and uh, better security um, out of the box. Um, just some you know, notes. Um, the workload is deployed on bare metal contained by uh, LexD. More secure, um, basically you have isolation so you can't get to the BIOS and, and have BIOS type of issues. Um, and you have the ZFS backend, so we'll support that OpenStack with LexD with the ZFS backend uh, for the super fast performance. So for anyone wanting to... You no longer have to worry about uh, having libvirt in there, and you don't have to deal with all of that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. There. You can run OpenStack completely without libvirt uh, using LexD in containers. And um, for things like Neutron and being able to get access to the network stack, that has also been integrated? Yep. So <laughs> if you want to try that out, um, we have a project called Conjure Up. Uh, you can go to conjure-up.io. Um, Website is still a little rough. We're working on it. Um, it's all moving very quickly. So essentially, you can do a sudo app install conjure up, and then sudo, actually, that's not right. You just have to do a conjure up OpenStack. You don't have to be rude to do it. Um, and what this will do is bring up um, a, a basically NCURSES based UI, like you see there. And it'll ask you uh, a couple of questions. Uh, and what it'll allow you to do is to deploy OpenStack to a single machine, as long as it has about 8 gigs of RAM and a couple cores. Um, pure LexD. So it's not going to install it into KVMs or anything. It's going to install uh, all the, you know, the, the, the services, the OpenStack services, uh, you know, Neutron and Keystone and, and Horizon, everything into a container. Um, it's going to set up all the relations for you by default. You don't have to worry about any configs. Um, and it's going to configure NC LexD. So it's 100% single system, um, container-based OpenStack deploy. Um, and you just guide it through it with a NCURSES based uh, UI. And it's as simple as sudo apt install conjure up, or technically you could do sudo apt uh, install um, OpenStack, and it'll bring in conjure up, and then you just have to do conjure up OpenStack. Uh, that also works for other things as well. So conjure up is not just uh, an OpenStack uh, installer per se, it's uh, a generalized uh, installer for almost anything that's complex. So the other one that uh, we offer today is that you can conjure up big data. So you could uh, sudo apt install conjure up, and then do sudo, uh, I'm sorry, you don't even need to do sudo, just conjure up uh, big data. And then it'll bring you to one of these types of windows here where it'll ask you, I think we have five or six different uh, big data solutions today that are bundled, um, you know, Hadoop or, or Spark um, based uh, that you can deploy, and it'll do it all in containers. Uh, on a single system, um, and you can go to town with playing around and getting familiar with it. So that's interesting for someone who wants to get familiar uh, with those experiences uh, for either you know big data applications or with OpenStack. Uh, it's obviously not very useful outside of a, a lab type environment. Uh, so what Conjure Up also does is it connects uh, to Maz. Maz is our metal as a service offering, um, and what that basically does um, is allow you to treat your physical hardware assets as if they were cloud-like or virtual. So you just register um, you know, your servers with the Maz, um, and then Maz provides a uh, rich API out to other tooling. Uh, so for us, that's Juju, and Juju is our application uh, modeling tooling, which I can get into a little more detail if you guys are interested. But what that allows for this is basically if you have a Maz up and running with a number of servers in it, 
this uh, UI will ask you um, what environment you want to use. You can say, I want to use a LexD environment or I want to use a MAS environment. If you say MAS, you just point it to your MAS. And instead of actually deploying this on a single system um, you know, with, with a container, it will actually allow you to deploy it to physical uh, hardware. By default, it'll do auto placement, which means all the services that are contained in those bundles, whether it's OpenStack or some sort of a Spark uh, combination, um, will be auto placed uh, within MAS and the hardware that's available. Or you can actually do placement. There's a placement UI within here. So it'll list all of your uh, assets in MAS on one side, and it'll list all the available um, services on the other side. And you can one for one assign them. Um, and then it'll walk you through the relations, because it knows um, it's all based on Juju and Juju and your Juju charms. Uh, know um, what the relations are between the services um, so you can just basically connect them up and you're, you're good to go. So super, super simple, easy way to get familiar with OpenStack or big data solutions uh, on, on Ubuntu today. Uh, and you can, you can give it a try. Uh, it's out there. It's available. Questions? Cool. Uh, let me see what else. Oh, Linux One. So, um, how many people here have access to a mainframe, an S390? <laughs> okay, you should talk to IBM. One of, <laughs> you should talk to IBM about that. Supposedly, they're going to make access to uh, mainframes a little bit easier. What do they cost now? <laughs> so I can't get into Maybe that. Used? I can't get into that. I can say that in Ubuntu, on a mainframe, uh, from sort of a you know competitive cost analysis, is going to be. Night and day. I mean, it's going to be vastly cheaper to run Ubuntu on uh, a mainframe than it will be to run uh, Red Hat or, or SUSE. Um, I can't go into our pricing um, because that hasn't been officially announced yet. But what I can say is that we're not. One second, we're not based on IFLs like a RHEL or a, a SLES. We're based on draws. So you pay for the draw. However many IFLs you have in that draw, you pay one price, and you can spin up as many instances as you want. Question? Will it run on the Open Power platform? Yes. So um, a couple of releases back, um, we worked with IBM in partnership to actually port to Open Power. Um, so we work on, um, well, technically, we could work on Power 7 if you had special firmware. Um, but Power 8 and Open Power, absolutely 100%. Not only that, but we support OpenStack and all the other tooling that I talked about. We support that on uh, Power and Open Power as well as uh, the mainframe. So all of our tooling, uh, it's actually a guarantee that we have uh, as part of our IBM partnership. Uh, that all of our tooling will work on both Power, uh, Open Power, and uh, S390 mainframe equivalent to x86 or ARM. And if you are interested in uh, giving uh, it a try, uh, I would, if you have an IBM rep, uh, you know, if you work for an enterprise and you have an IBM rep, ask them. I, I think they're trying to work on getting people access to these to go give it a try. Uh, in academia, um, they're really going after sort of uh, the college, college, college kids. Uh, to try and bootstrap them uh, into thinking um, that you know developing on a mainframe is is a more natural thing, um, <laughs> so they they have a huge university program now where they actually provide um, you know college kids and professors access to mainframes uh, to develop Ubuntu, on Ubuntu on a mainframe. Um, I used to do it you know back in the days I, I worked uh, for about ten years at Bear Stearns uh, and we used to use SLES on the mainframe all the time, uh, and those are actually the early days. Um, it's grown like crazy since then. Actually, this announcement is, is massive for us. You wouldn't believe the, the traction we've got from you know, all the big financials and all the big insurance companies, um, especially since we keep teasing the pricing. I mean, the, the per draw pricing model is, is just massive to them. Any more questions on S390? <laughs> so essentially, a draw, if you think of like a classic uh, server rack um, and think of it like a 4U uh, system, um, but it's all integrated into like the mainframe chassis. Um, and it has a certain amount of compute capacity, um, you know, CPUs and memory and disk potentially. Um, and uh, each one of those um, is sold as an IFL, which is, I forget the actual what it means. It's like integrated something for Linux. It's, it's Linux. Yeah. Um, so essentially, you pay to enable one of those in the draw. You may have the mainframe sitting in your. Uh, data center, it uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you actually paid for all the capacity of that mainframe. So you pay to enable that capacity. Um, and usually, you pay on like an IFL um, per IFL basis. Um, and they're all contained within a draw. So if you have a draw with, I don't know, I'll pick an arbitrary number, you know, 40 IFLs on it, um, if it was like Red Hat or SUSE, you would pay per 
instance on that IFL. So not only would you pay IBM to um, have rights to use the IFL, you would have to then pay Red Hat or SUSE. And their list price is, I don't know, I think it's like 12 grand or something uh, per instance. Um, the difference for us is that we just you pay one price for the draw, and we don't care how many IFLs you have in there. So it's a dramatic reduction uh, in pricing um, for running Linux, supported enterprise Linux on the mainframe. Um, we're also huge partners with IBM. They're enabling all of their um, you know, product on there. Uh, so DB2 and everything. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really exciting. Uh, it's kind of crazy. It's a ton of work. Um, but we're more than happy to take it on. Um, yeah. The reason why IBM came to us is because of, you know, in the earlier slides, I had the massive ecosystem that we bring uh, with us, like the 20,000 packages and all. Um, and what they realized was that um, most developers uh, coming out of college these days develop, uh, who develop on Linux tend to develop on their laptop uh, on Ubuntu. Um, so they wanted to gain that sort of developer mind share. Um, and interestingly enough, um, the other thing that we found and it's why Microsoft um, has the, the bash on, on Windows uh, projects that, that they're doing with us, is that the majority of developers uh, who are developing on Linux who have uh, you know, Mac uh, laptops actually have an Ubuntu uh, image running as a virtual machine on there that they're developing against. Um, and this is like a, a big trend uh, that, that everyone's noticing. So what, uh, Microsoft decided is they're starting to offer you know hardware now too um, in terms of Surface and, and you know laptops and such that hey they want to do the same thing they want to be able to make sure that all the young kids coming out of university who are developing are Ubuntu on either uh, uh, you know a ThinkPad or a, a MacBook um, you know they want that same um, you know the same momentum basically on their uh, platform as well um, so that's why IBM approached us um, to basically port you know, our distribution to the IBM mainframe. Uh, it's the same reason why I did it on the Power 8. Um, I think everyone pretty much knows that they got out of the x86 business and sold it off to Lenovo, uh, first on the, the desktop and uh, laptop side, and then on the, the server side. So they're 100% vested in power being a success. They're 100% vested in making sure that power is uh, on par um, with uh, you know, x86 and ARM as far as an end user developer experience. Um, and from a performance perspective, uh, in many instances, it tends to blow the doors off of you know, x86 and especially ARM. Uh, ARM is obviously a different model altogether. So it's an interesting question. Um, we probably run on more architectures today, supported architectures than any other enterprise Linux out there. Like I said, we will support you on a micro device with Snappy, we'll support you on a phone, uh, we'll support you on any number of ARM SOCs. Um, uh, we support you on obviously x86, we support you on power, uh, and we support you on uh, S390Z series now. Someone did once ask me, what about i-series? And I forgot that IBM has i-series. And uh, I think the only difference technically between i-series and p-series is like a, a firmware difference. You may know, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so super excited about that. Um, again, this isn't my deck. This is a video of Mark Shuttleworth talking about it. I mean, I think the deck's gonna be made available if you wanna watch that video. Um, you know, go ahead. Um, but yeah, that's our release. Um, comes out tomorrow officially. We're super excited about it. Um, questions? I think, what are we doing on time? Okay. Thank you. I think I'm supposed to do some questions, right? That next. Right. Okay. Um, if anyone has any questions they want to ask at the end here, please come on right up to the microphones. Yeah, go ahead. Please come on. Yep. So if I'm running the same application in multiple XD containers, yep. is the text segment of those executables duplicated for each container? Text segment. Um, potent potentially, if it's a copy on write image, um, I don't know, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't think so, no, not, not by default. I think you can probably get it to, to work that way, but out of the box, that's not gonna be how it works. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, my memory's a little hazy. If 1510 had systemd as the default in its system, but 1604, does, is systemd SMD, the default? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Super okay. excited about that. <laughs> so I have a question. I don't know if you can answer, but have you, has Canonical done any benchmarks of OpenZS performance on Ubuntu compared to other operating systems that also run ZFS? So like Solaris or? Solaris, FreeBSD. 
Um, only two I know of. Honestly, no, we haven't. Okay. Um, Have you done the benchmarks versus other Linux file systems, XFS, uh, 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 ButterFS? So we don't support ButterFS. Uh, you can run better ButterFS on Ubuntu. Um, if you care about your data, we recommend you not run ButterFS. Um, um, we support probably more file systems than almost any other enterprise distribution, you know, EXT, 3, 4, um, XFS. Um, and so on and so forth. Um, but we never, do, I, not to my knowledge, we probably have done the benchmarks. I just don't have that data. We have a kernel team that does that. Do you support installing Ubuntu on ZFS as a root file system? Technically, no. Um, you can do that, I believe, but um, technically we don't support it now. Can you elaborate why? Huh? Can you elaborate on why? I think uh, just because it's our first release, and I think that we may get to that point, but we just don't do it today. Which I think is the opposite of what SUSE did when I was there with ButterFS. I think, I don't know if anyone uses SLES today, but they support ButterFS for root, but not for data. Which I always thought was strange, because like, I mean, if it's not good enough for your root, it's good enough for your data drives. <laughs> um, not to knock them, I used to work there, they're a good distribution. So if I, uh, built a ZFS array with Solaris. Can I literally plug it into my Ubuntu machine? I believe so. Cool. Great. Yeah. I. Uh, I believe so. Yes. Cool. Let us know. <laughs> um, does uh, Ceph take advantage of ZFS for its copy and write now? That's a good question. I actually don't know. Sorry. Uh, is there any plans on Canonical's roadmap to uh, support live kernel updating and patching? Yes, we actually support that with 16.04. It's not on the deck, and it's, I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, we absolutely support it with 16.04. It's not going to be the initial release. It's going to be, I believe, on our first hardware enablement kernel. Um, but yeah, absolutely, be able to su uh, support live kernel patching updates. I was wondering if you could tell us what a Xeris is. Oh, <laughs> so that was one of the questions I was going to ask you guys. Um, um, oh, sorry. Have, then, then, then you can leave oh, it. oh, and somebody already answered it. Yeah, it's like a South African squirrel. Small African squirrel. Yeah. Uh, um, so I think he gets a book, maybe. I don't know. That was one of my questions. <laughs> so, do, you mind, do you mind if I ask quickly a follow-up to that? Sorry. So, so two more releases, and then you're down to Z. What happens after that? Only Mark Shotworth knows. We, we don't close our doors and walk away, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, well, go ahead, excuse me. Sure. Is it, is it true that in 1604 we are, we are able to move the Unity launcher to the bottom? For desktop, yes, you can do Okay, that. thank you. If you want to know how, search uh, Dustin Kirkland, Unity, whatever, toolbar. I know that's super important for a lot of people, uh, so yeah, we can do that. Um, okay, uh, it seems to me like we're out of questions. Uh, let's, um, let's actually have Dan ask uh, you a few questions. We have the trivia segment now. Um, Dan is going to ask whatever he wants. He was a last minute presenter. I'm not going to hold him to this being um, specific to the deck. So uh, he has questions. If you have answers, then we have uh, four books up here. Uh, if you answer correctly, you get to come and choose your book. Um, first question. Uh, okay, yes, sorry. Good point. The rules are, please raise your hand and uh, I'll call on you. you. You ask the question, I'll call. Whoever I see, whoever's hand I see go up first, I will call on you. Please don't just shut out the answer because if you're right, someone else will get your, uh, the fruits of your labor. So um, that makes people very upset. So um, yeah, go right ahead. Cool, I'm just gonna wing this. Um, I said I checked about, I don't know, three or four weeks ago um, and how many, over how many packages were already compiled for the System Z? Uh, I saw you in the back middle there. I saw your hand go up first, yes. Yep, that's right. All right, come on up, have a book. Uh, next question. Um, from our viewpoint, what is the, uh, the big difference between the LexD container uh, experience and the Docker container experience? Your, your hand shot up before you could even finish. Please go ahead. Yeah, it's a standard Linux environment, yeah. That's so, good enough, I'd give yep, it to Docker, you. single app, <laughs> LXD, uh, system image. Come on up. Next. We have two more, right? Yep. Uh, 
What was, uh, what was our support for LexD with an OpenStack called? What was the uh, package name? Uh, I saw your hand going up. Uh, mm -mm. That's close. Mm -hmm. was, is the, what's the, the acronym? It wasn't Nova. I think it was. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, technically, we would say NC LexD, but it's good enough. <laughs> last question? Last book we. Uh... The last question. Um... C++ without fear. Um. <laughs> what is our standard release cycle for Ubuntu Server? Uh, I saw your hand going up again. Yes. Yep, that's right. Come on. That's our books. Uh, we're going to be heading out to, uh, what was the name of that? Jake Saloon? Was that right? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Jake Saloon, it's over on 7th Avenue. Yeah, on, uh, so off 7th Avenue on 23rd Street, southwest corner on uh, 23rd Street. So uh, come on along. Hopefully we'll see you there.